in my sophomore year, I came across an ode that T.S. Eliot penned for his Harvard graduation a little over a century ago. Eliot wrote of his departure from undergraduate life, we turn as thy sons ever turn in strength of the hopes that thy blessings bestow from the hopes and ambitions that sprang at thy feet to the thoughts of the past as we go. I wondered as I read it, what thoughts of the past might T.S. Eliot have carried with him from a Harvard so different than that we've come to know. My friends and I began asking how we remember Harvard. Which of our Cambridge memories would cast that long shadow of our young selves across whatever futures await. There's much to remember of the past four years, for these have been times of great change for Harvard and for ourselves. We've seen the inauguration of the university's first female president and the installment of the first black dean of the college. We've learned that regardless of what contractual obligations you might be under, you should always use a barricade at a Girl Talk concert. Here, we've been humbled by the first failures of our young lives and grown bold walking grounds once tread by greatness. We've come to know each other as only Harvard students can, forming bonds in long afternoons of leisure of in Charles and in the late night anxieties of Lamont, strengthening our ties to each other in the hopes of early years. Tomorrow, when we graduate, these become things of the past. We're told that it's time to move on. There's an anxiety in this change, a bitterness in leaving those who knew us as we came to know ourselves. For me, there's a fear that more than specific lunches or lectures, I'd only remember that feeling of Harvard, of sharing with friends the energy of limitless potential, along with the sad wisdom that one day very soon now, our time together would come to a close. And hoping to still this anxiety, I broke a promise I made to myself the day I submitted my senior thesis. And I returned for one last time to a Harvard University library. It was here that I came across the memoirs of a lieutenant in the First World War, Calvin Wellington Day. At Harvard, He'd been a student of physics from 1912 to 1914, a gifted student who enjoyed evenings in his graduate student physics laboratory and evenings of typically collegiate mischief. Calvin wrote affectionately of his final days in Cambridge, of green lawns and graduation, capturing that electricity of being young and fearless at university. After he graduated, he returned to the yard for one last look, he wrote, quite poetically, I think, that he did not believe a place could change so quickly as did Harvard Square after class day. The yard was like a vase with its flowers removed, yet beautiful. Calvin's wartime letters possess that same lyricism. The impassioned patriotism of a young man ready to save the world, the eager loyalty of a Harvard alumnus concerned with the scores of the latest Yale game and the fate of his university friends. But as his time in Europe drew on, Calvin's letters began to reveal that ugliness of World War I, the chaos of battle and the madness of inaction. Nine days before his death at the Second Battle of Ypres, Calvin was ordered to the small village of Casal, France. He wrote of his arrival I pushed my bike up to the highest point where there was an old chateau, a little park, and a wireless station. Here, I was agreeably and intensely surprised. The only other soldier up there was Brokenshire, Harvard class of 1916. I hadn't seen him since we left camp in England. We sat in one of those stone bastions very like those from Fresh Pond in Cambridge, which I remember so well, overlooking the level plain in the mist and gathering darkness. Here, 
we talked of Harvard and of Cambridge, the places and girls we'd known. It was a pleasing and impressive sight in the setting sun, and I was sorry to leave him to it. Though Calvin couldn't know that this was the last time he'd meet his friend, though he was never again to set foot in the yard, the memories of Harvard that Calvin Wellington Day carried with him gave him peace in disquiet, a loyal friend when the world was at war. He departed from Harvard with that same heavy sadness that weighs upon us all, but quickly found that behind his fears of leaving was the truth that he'd never left Harvard behind. I found a sort of confidence in the letters of Calvin Wellington Day that whether we're destined for New York or New Guinea, Harvard will remain beside us long after commencement has come and passed. I've come to see the buildings around us, Widener and Weld, Seaver and Robinson, not as tombs for the best years of our lives past, but as enduring monuments to those feelings of unsettled excitement for the lives we're about to begin. On Friday, we set out to realize all that we've hoped for together these past four years. When life has done its worst, and I need a friend, I know I'll look no further than to those who stood beside me through the trials of undergraduate years. And when we feel that the weight of the world rests squarely upon our shoulders, when uglier times are upon us, Harvard gives us a place of glad escape, a better age of our best selves to remember. These, I think, are the thoughts of the past that T.S. Eliot anticipated when he closed his poem. He wrote, yet for all of these years that tomorrow has lost, we still are less able to grieve for so much that of Harvard we carry away in the place of the life that we leave. Like Eliot, I'm unsure of what will come from the hopes and ambitions that sprang here. I don't know when and where we'll meet again, but in the memoirs of a lieutenant from the First World War, I found reason to believe this much, that we'll never forget what this place has meant to us each, nor what we have meant to each other.